We need young people to want to become teachers. And I'm worried that this is becoming a hard sell. Data from the National Center for Education Statistics is pointing to some depressing trends. Schools struggle to find and retain highly qualified teachers. Teachers are not getting the early career training and professional development they need to be successful. Tough school environments are demoralizing to teachers, and low teacher salary is turning college graduates away from the profession. All four of these trends are exponentially observed in high poverty public schools. So the students that need the best of us continue to get the least. On the ground, teachers are being asked to do some seemingly impossible things. Try to teach algebra to students whose bellies are rumbling for the only meal they might eat that day, or who miss school because they need to care for baby siblings while their single parent works. The adverse childhood experiences that co correlate with living in poverty make learning very difficult. The brain is in survival mode. Affluent students face a different kind of stress. You've probably seen the news. Depression and anxiety rates among college students have skyrocketed in the last decade. And though we are quick to point to smartphones and social media as the cause, we are now realizing that causation is more complex. I have taught students with every material advantage who have struggled with reading comprehension because they lack background knowledge. They don't experience the same more serious poverty of uh, material poverty but there's a deprivation of free time, of time for play and exploration and reading for pleasure, and of time for conversing with a caring adult who doesn't have an agenda for them. So sometimes as a teacher, we fantasize about doing something where we don't have to think and feel at the same time, like Stocking supermarket shelves sounds pretty sweet right now. In some states, you could work your way up to a supermarket manager position and make more money than you'll ever make in a year of teaching. Florida ranks 46th in the nation for average teacher salary. In Hillsborough County Schools this year, the starting salary is $40,000 but it's capped at 68. In 2020, the average supermarket manager's salary is $79,000. Teaching isn't an attractive career to young adults who have thousands to repay in student loans, or young families who need to afford the cost of childcare. Of course, it's not all about the money. There are other reasons to become a teacher. Some would say it's about the summers off. I would argue that many teachers spend those summers trying to supplement their income. But maybe you're lucky enough to get to do that in a way that lets you pursue another passion. Write a book, travel, raise a family, start a business, go teach somewhere else in the world. I became a teacher backwards. Most teachers gain experience and eventually become expert educators. I became an expert and then had to learn to become a teacher. As a freshman in college, I enrolled in a course called Introduction to Learning Disabilities. I did this because my younger brother is dyslexic, and I had always been fascinated by how his mind works, especially in comparison to my own. He hated school, and I loved it. 
On the first day of this class, my professor delivered this line. He said, what it means to have a learning disability is more complex than popular culture can handle. I felt like I was on fire. I thought about my brother's experience and nothing seemed more true than this statement. I earned a bachelor's and a master's. I took classes called things like typical and atypical cognition and the neurobiological substrates of learning disabilities. I learned about human psychology and the artful ways that children hide their vulnerabilities. I became a detective and a therapist and a great actress to help these students. And I thought, you know, I'll write a book or I'll pursue research or I'll go into private practice. But then I thought, you know what, I, I probably should gain more experience working with students first, you know, within the system. So I signed up for a teacher certification course. Those first two years, I was enamored, but I was also frustrated. How do we know so much about human psychology and cognition and learning and the brain, and yet it's not being put to practice in schools? I realized that the linear, traditional model of school disbars many of the students that I serve students like my brother. We know this. We've studied it for years. More than a decade ago now, Sir Ken Robinson stood on a TED stage and delivered a talk on how schools kill creativity. It's one of the most viewed TED Talks ever. Because of his work and many, many others, independent and public schools that break that factory teach to test mold have been built and many of them are thriving. There are also teachers at ordinary schools doing extraordinary work. I once had the privilege of working with a talented team of middle school humanities teachers in Chicago, Illinois. Together we lamented that our students were losing the ability to learn from reading the textbook. So we flipped this observation into a question. How can we ditch the textbook but still teach them to read nonfiction? We decided to design a reading unit around the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. We decided this after we thought about middle schoolers' innate obsession with justice and fairness. Reading about ancient Mesopotamia was a snooze fest for them and for us. But have you ever met an 11-year-old who realizes that something is not fair? Because they're intense. We split the students up into groups by reading level and by maturity. They would study the power of hate, the power of groups, the power of individuals, and the power of leadership. We had them, we had them read deep and wide with texts that we had curated, articles and books and essays. We designed reading lessons to complement both the readings and the readers. We mixed the students and had them discuss what they were learning with each other and we showed them visuals and photographs and discussed media literacy. We had all the students write. They wrote reflections and essays and poetry. And to culminate the unit, we took them to one of Chicago's great museums. And we had them meet with expert museum curators to learn how to design effective exhibits. We tasked the students in one week to build their own civil rights museum to educate their community on the movement. I remember a student of mine with ADHD bouncing alongside his group, which sat 
armed with the task of representing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s struggle. Guys, 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 I know what we can do. We'll build his jail cell, and people who come to the museum can sit in jail and read that letter he wrote. Man, how are we going to build a jail cell that people can sit in? I know how, I know how, I know how. I'll show you. And he did. You see, this student, when he was supposed to be doing his homework, was often doing things like upholstering chairs and building furniture in his garage. Another student I taught with dyslexia but technological savvy rigged his iPad to a podium. Visitors to the museum could read the speeches of Dr. King alongside the speeches of Malcolm X and reflect on their own oratory power on his screen. The power of hate groups struggled. How could they tell the story of what happened to Emmett Till? Could they build the casket? Could they print the photograph of his face? What if younger students were to visit the museum, third graders? Was it appropriate to expose them to the power of hate too early? These students grappled with some of the same tough questions that Mrs. Till, an American journalist, faced in 1955. A group of sixth graders taught me about Claudette Colvin. At 15, they read, she refused to give up her seat on the bus months before the famous Rosa Parks. And they wanted to keep reading to understand why. We realized as teachers that we had done great work when we learned as much as our students did. The kids were on fire, and we were on fire. We had already created the conditions for them to flourish. So mostly at that point, we just had to get out of their way. We can learn most of the content we need to know on the internet. The information is there. It's there with visuals. It's there with text. It's there in multiple layers of complexity. Now it's there with a virtual tutor or a trained teacher presenting it. What it means to be a teacher is changing. And we need young, creative people to help us adapt. We need teachers that are expert curators who can design an experience that maximizes the human potential for learning. Because learning can be as interesting as a video game or a Netflix program, but only when it is well designed. We need teachers that embrace complexity in the classroom because causality is complex and people are complex. We need teachers that understand people and that like people and that bring joy into learning. We need teachers that approach underachievement with curiosity instead of judgment because why not? Imagine what we could do for those failing students if we worked together more often, if we bent the rules more often to figure them out. I, Gen, Generation Z, we need you. The teaching profession needs you. If you hated school and you didn't do your homework because it didn't hold your attention, but you love learning and you love people, we need you. We need your powers of creativity and collaboration. If you have a dream to change the world at large, we need you. Believe it or not, that dream is transferable, and it can be multiplied. 
You may be humbled by the power and potential of some of your students, but then you get to be a part of their dream and inspire their vision for the future. Finally, we need the worldview that you guys have had to develop much faster and earlier than any previous generation because of the information delivered to your fingertips daily. And you need us. One of the greatest remedies for anxiety, the greatest sources of lifelong contentment is service to a higher purpose. You can contribute to building the most important tools on earth, human minds. Thank you. <laughs>